leading us, and uh, it's good to be together. You know, many of us were serving this weekend, and it was a, really a wonderful experience. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I just I especially want to thank you, Skip, for leading that and all the work that you did in putting that together. So thank you, Skip. Uh, it's just wonderful to be a community and all that work together and so many uh, helped. And uh, it really is a, a, part of God, a part of God's kingdom vision, and that's what I want to talk about today, about entering into God's kingdom vision as covenant people. We, we've been in this series on being covenant people, and as followers of Christ, we spend a lot of effort and time on being the church, so I'd like to talk about where this is all going, and it's uh, going to God's kingdom vision. Uh, God invites us to live in his vision of a new kingdom. Now, kingdom is a hard to relate to word nowadays. It, uh, we, had, we have very few governing kings and queens, unless you count the ones in Game of Thrones, then you got a whole bunch of them there. But, uh, it, and it can have a kind of an old-fashioned fairy tale, hierarchical, and even oppressive connotations. And I, I, that's not what God intended. God's kingdom is nothing like the earthly kingdoms we experience. It's the power of the cross versus the power of the sword. It is transforming lives versus controlling behavior. It is intrinsically universal versus tribal nationalism. It is a relational universe versus a legal universe. It's an ecosystem of grace versus toil and performance. It is the rule of love versus the rule of power. The kingdom is God's vision for his covenant people. Thy kingdom come is one of the first phrases we learn in Scripture. And Jesus teaches about the kingdom over a hundred times in Scripture. He says things like, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. And the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. And my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus teaching us that we need help from beyond this world to become a people. All four Gospels center around the life of Christ to teach us about God. And I encourage you, if you ever want to start somewhere in Scripture, just to go, what, what is this all about? Start in the Gospels. They're, they're just wonderful stories about Jesus and his teaching. And today we're looking at two teachings of Jesus, one recorded by John, a disciple, and the other recorded by Matthew. And I don't know if you've watched The Chosen at all, but it has such a great description of these two characters, of John and of Matthew, don't you think, Evelyn, Mr. Evelyn? I really, I just cried at Julia, right? And it's very fun to watch this. And in the first 12 chapters of Matthew's gospel, he emphasizes the person of Jesus. So if you're reading that gospel, you'll see those first 12 chapters are all about the person of Jesus. But then in chapter 13, the story shifts to the kingdom parables. It's really interesting. And this theologian, Dale Bruner, he says this, that in Matthew 13, the emergence is the emergence of the disciple community. That's us. All of a sudden, the story goes from Jesus to, all of a sudden, it's like, oh, wow, he's talking to us. Like, wow, we, we got some work to do. It's the emergence of God's new covenant people. And it doesn't mean the old covenant people aren't included. It's not like, we got a new covenant, and those old people, we're not, we're not about those. It's like, no, it's a new covenant that includes, that pulls everybody in, that says this new thing is being birthed. We are called to emerge as the disciple community. That's us. It's why we're doing this series and all that we do here at Woodside Village Church. Like everything we're doing here is for us to emerge as the disciple community. Jesus' intention is not just new information. C.S. Lewis talks about this. Uh, it's not just new information. It's new creatures who become new selves to become new people, a covenant people. We're called to emerge as the disciple community. So we have these two parables about the kingdom. So uh, it, I'll start with Matthew here. So here's Matthew, and he tells these, he records Jesus telling these two parables about a mustard seed and about the yeast. And I just want you to imagine, just for a moment, a king or queen standing before, I'm gonna, can you follow me on, just some, I just wanna, I just wanna pretend like I'm a king. 
It's feeling good here. I'm a king. And can you imagine, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come out, I'm going to rouse up my people, I'm going to go, my kingdom is like a mustard seed. <laughs> huh? How about, what a, this, what a vision, right? You just hear people going, I, 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 think, I think we're in the wrong place here. I, I'm, I'm a little worried about this guy. All right, I got a better one. It's about yeast and bread. <laughs> what? I, I, you can just see it's like the opposite of power. It is, Jesus gives us this paradox. It's like, he, he stops and goes, my kingdom, it's like a little seed. <laughs> it's, a mustard seed. It's, like a, it's like some yeast. You can see warriors and titans of industry all going, you, you got to be kidding me. This, I gave, I'm giving my life to this. There's actually, historians will look at where did Jesus lose Judas. It's on these kinds of teachings. Because there were, and, and you kind of, you look at it, you go, you don't really blame him because he's thinking, hey, we, we got to take this over. I have much compassion on this person who's going, hey, I, I don't know any, we're getting ruined here. And so it's, it's, it's really, a, it's a really profound teaching that Jesus is trying to reorient everybody, that the littleness, the smallness, the humble way of his kingdom has great power. That's the paradox. His humble way leads to profound ends. And we are to have confidence in the unsensational way of bringing about Jesus' kingdom as sheltering trees and nourishing loaves. We are the trees of shelter, the loaves of food for a needy world. That is God's covenant people. The mustard seed yeast gospel changes lives. There's so much more to the seed and the yeast than meets the eye. We have no idea of the transformative power of the little mustard seed and the yeast in our lives. Christ's mustard seed yeast power has a purpose, to live in the vision of the kingdom that is in us. This is how the world is transformed, is because people are transformed. And it's where John gives us more clues as to what Jesus meant by this mustard seed yeast base, faith. So now you move to John. And John's gospel is really interesting. It's really an amazing gospel. It's actually, he's using um, uh, temple language. And he says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. That remaining, is a, it's a abiding, it is dwelling. Dwell in me as I dwell in you. This is, everybody who was reading this, these first century uh, Jewish community were reading that going, wow, you're using temple language. God dwells in the temple. Remember in Indiana Jones? Remember the temple? Remember? Okay, never mind. All right. So it was really great. You ought to see the movie. That's really good. And so he's dwelling in there. But now God Later in Revelation, you'll read where he'll say, there's no temple. The dwelling place of God is the people. It's so, it's amazing, it's beautiful language. I think these two disciples are working together. What's interesting, they were together when all these, te all these experiences happened, but later they're writing on their own. It, it's so I, I, fascinating to me that these disciples, the Holy Spirit working in them to, to teach us, to give us these, these words and the mustard seed yeast is the kingdom practice of abiding work. We remain or abide or dwell in Christ, and Christ remains, abides, dwells in us. Jesus revealing the relational nature of the kingdom. We don't just have a belief. We have a relational confidence in Christ. Abiding means receiving Christ. That's why you may have heard that in churches when we talk about, have you received Christ? It, it's not a, it might sound weird, but it's not our intent. It's meant to, have you begun this relationship with Christ, entered into this relationship? Relationships grow, they're dynamic, they're not, they're, they don't stay the same. You nurture them, you abide in them. And abiding means receiving Christ, nurturing our souls, resting in our image, our likeness and identity of Christ, in Christ. Abiding work is internal, reflective, and most importantly, it's relational. It is the Lord's Prayer, putting on the yoke of Christ. 
He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. Paul writes that in Philippians. God begins a work, and then it moves. It continues to complete that work. It is learning to live freely and lightly. It is David, the King David, facing his sin. Paul, facing his pride. Peter, facing himself. This is abiding work. We're all growing. We're all learning. Now, abiding work is introspection. And it's how we're formed. That we, we have this introspection. And, and, uh, but we don't just stay there. We, we don't just stay in introspection. We don't just do navel-gazing. Did I say that with my outside voice? Sorry. All right. So we, our formation is something else. It involves extrospection. It's the observation of things external to one's own mind, as opposed to introspection, which is the consideration and observation of things internal to the self. God uses both the inner and outer work to integrate, shape, form us into his covenant people. Extrospection is where we enter into abounding work as Christ followers. This weekend, we're moving things out. We are building things. We are getting rid of things. I'm trying to, we're keeping things. We're trying to decide all that work, all of us working together is giving each other feedback about how we work. What is it like for me to express who I am? And I get feedback. So it's like, hey, relax, Charlie. I, I need that. We don't, we don't have to, just, we're in relationship. Don't let the work get in the way of the relationship. And I'm reminded of that. That's that extrospection. We are always covenanting with God to do two kinds of formation work, abiding and abounding. Abounding is this work that we do. Abiding formation transforms how we understand and live in the way God sees us. That's the abiding work. I, I, I have introspection. I listen to God. I meet God. I discover who I am in Christ. Abounding formation transforms how we understand and live in the way God sees the world. And both help us. I see me, I see how I'm loved by God. I also see how others are loved by God. And then living in the kingdom vision of God is the integration of abiding and abounding transformation. Developing God's kingdom vision inside us so that we may live into that vision. This vision is at the heart of the Lord's prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I, it really, this will be the hardest prayer you will ever pray. Not my will, your will. Because I like doing things my way. I, I just want you to know, I do. I am, I profess that. Honey, do you feel better? Profess that. I just want to make sure you feel like, thank God. She's going, thank God. Because I like doing things my way. When we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, we are praying that Christ's kingdom will be in us so that we may express it outside us. This kingdom vision gives us new vision. Uh, there's this great verse that Paul writes. He says this, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. Now, I want you to think about that. We see everything with new eyes. This internal work makes me see the whole world differently. That's the power of the mustard seed, the strength of the yeast, the transforming nature of abiding in Christ. We regard to or see no one from a worldly point of view. We see everyone from a, as a spiritual being. From a spiritual viewpoint, because Christ is in us. Abiding, our problem is poor eyesight, poor vision, to see the world differently. Abiding and abounding are always working together in Jesus' kingdom. And I want you to think about something. How do you see yourself? Think of all the pain we inflict on ourselves. Self-recrimination, shame, low self-worth. handcuffed to addictions. We have a spiritual seeing problem. 
We don't see ourselves with spiritual eyes. Christ comes to us and says, you are beloved. You are beloved. You have worth and value. Now, we don't just stay there, do we? Think of all the pain we inflict on each other. Disdain, judgmentalism, othering, anger, impatience, rudeness, not to mention the larger systemic issues like racism or war or violence. Would we do these things or allow others to do these things if we saw others in God's image? Much of the great pain in human history, from slavery to human trafficking to mass shootings, stem from the loss of seeing each other's personhood in our world. Maybe we need special glasses. Special eyesight. Okay, this is going to totally date me. In the 80s, there was a B-movie sci-fi called They Live. Did anybody ever see this movie? I just wish somebody, nobody. Wow, I'm alone. I'm alone in this moment right here. This is so great. This is the kind of pastor you've got right here. Uh, God is with me. God was with me when I watched this when I was in my 20s. And, and it's, a, it's a movie called They Live, and the only way you could see the aliens, the monsters, was if you had these special glasses that you put on and went, oh my God, I'm being... We're being ruined here. They've, it's a conspiracy. I'm not, okay, just, I'm not a weird conspiracy guy, by the way. Just, just stay with me here. Okay, don't worry. Uh, but it was, it's a great movie, by the way. And Rowdy Roddy Piper, he was a wrestler. He was in, this is getting worse, isn't it? Right? <laughs> so, and I just love this movie. And, and I just thought, wow, God is trying to give us new glasses. The little mustard seed, the yeast, is it in reverse? The seed and yeast provide transformed lenses to see ourselves and each other as sacred beings creating the image of God. Eternal beings are walking around everywhere. Imagine if you could see the way God sees. Scripture says we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, abiding and abounding. That word workmanship, this is for you artists. Are there artists here? I just, I, I yeah, I just... I'm so grateful for the way you bring beauty into the world. This word workmanship comes from the Greek word poema. You see where I'm going? It means masterpiece in Greek. It's where we get our word poem. We are his masterpiece. Pieces. Others are the masterpiece of God. You might think, no, no, they're not. Yes, they are. Created in Jesus to do good works. Workmanship. Beautiful work. Jesus using abiding and abounding to help us with our vision to see with spiritual eyes, to see everything with the kingdom vision. Even the fruit we bear is internal, is internal and external. If you remain in me, my words remain in you. Jesus, who is the word, gives us his words to remain in us. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. In the parable, the internal faith of a mustard seed blossoms. The little powder of the yeast causes the bread to rise. Both abound. And a quick note about the mustard plant. It was an invasive plant. It was given the status of unclean. But here is Jesus using an invasive, unclean plant to bless the world. That should give us hope. Wherever you are, God is, wants to meet you and invite you into his kingdom vision. Our humanity comes to its fullest bloom when we live out of the abiding trust that we are beloved with others in the abounding work in God's kingdom. The church was meant to be the place where we build communities of love. Now, in, Henry Nowen said, we are called to be bread for each other, bread for the world. Abounding work, as opposed to toil, is the external expression of faith that invites us into the joy of kingdom work. Abounding stretches us, requires bravery, puts, us, puts our faith to the test. It includes the roles we take on as well as the responsibilities we carry. It's vocational, restorative, redemptive, and transformative. God is also speaking to us in the abounding work. He is with us. That is why we need to abide, and then we abound. To consider the messages God, has, God is trying to uh, send to us. But abiding always invites us to road test God's promises. God's invitation to abounding work is from the very beginning, with our ancestors working in the garden, to Israel leaving Egypt, to the church being created and sent by the Holy Spirit. It is Esther taking leadership, Micah calling the people back to righteousness, justice, and mercy, and the disciples feeding 5,000. 
That's the abounding work. These are stories of our ancestors who live by faith by putting into action what they were discovering in their abiding, in their abiding. They partnered with God in the kingdom work. I have a rock. I, I have a rock that says, be led. I wrote on a rock. I was at a retreat, and they said, hey, just write a couple of words. And I wrote, be led. Be led as the abiding work so that I move out with God into his kingdom work. Abounding is formational, reflective, relational as we develop new spiritual muscles. This outer work even feeds the internal work we've been doing. Abounding work is the expression, abiding, we are doing this with Christ. And then Jesus says these great words. He says, you'll do even greater work. That is a vision. This is the power of the mustard seed, the strength of the yeast. So I want to give you an integrated way to look at this. Now you really got to stay with me here. All right. I found a TV, and we're one day going to use one, but for now, all right. Stay with me here. Let's hopefully that. Do you see that? Here's a way to look at your life. Sometimes we, we think, what does this all mean? And uh, this is you. You're in the middle. There's you. And then around your life, you have your responsibilities. Now, Stephen Covey will call it, it's your circle of control. I don't like using that word control. Because control is an illusion, right? But you do have responsibilities. And the thing that really gets us overwhelmed is we have a lot of responsibilities. And then you have your influence, your circle of influence, places where, hey, I'm not, I'm not responsible for that, but I, I actually have influence over that. And then I have my circle of concerns, things I'm really concerned about, but I don't feel like I have much influence. I actually think this is where God invites us into prayer. God says, hey, pray about that. You're going to have to trust me. Okay. And then there's the unknown. Are you feeling a little heavy right now? This is just a little way of describing your life. You go, you mean there's things out there I don't even know about? Yes, right? You don't even know about it. What do I do with that? And I have my concerns. And actually, uh, uh, people who study the workplace and study um, uh, your vocation, when you have high risk, lot of big circle of responsibility and a big circle of concern and a little circle of influence, you're ready for a breakdown. When people feel like they have little influence, but they have lots of concerns and lots of responsibilities. And so there's you in the middle. All right. Amen. Let's pray. No, sorry. Let's go. All right. Jesus says, let me start here. That's the mustard seed. I'll call this the circle of identity. You have an identity. And Christ says, let me there. Let me be there. Let me be in that circle of identity. Let me be in your soul. The soul is the, it's the life center of the human being. It's why Jesus, it's so, the soul integrates everything. It's why Jesus died for souls. It's always, every that, that language, everybody's like, what is that language? Why, what is he saying there? He's saying, I am here for your soul. I know we got all this stuff out here, but let me start there. I died for you. I know we're doing a big kingdom vision here. It's, it starts here, right there. See, this is where you discover your belovedness. So abide in me. And then abound. The mustard seed faith, the yeast, starts right there. Oh, that invasive plant. Right? Amen, Amen right? It's an invasive plant. Start there. Let me have you see your responsibilities different. Let's learn to live freely and lightly in that space. And then discover that your influence is a loving person of what it means to see that you are already loved and that now you are free to care and move into the world and have places of influence and know that I, God knows the concerns and God knows the unknown and that mustard seed spreads 
It is God's vision for his covenant people. We are invited into this spiritual dimension shaping the physical dimension. Let's live in the vision of God with our real lives to reveal his love, offering ourselves as living sacrifices like our Savior who gave us a meal to remind us that we are now part of his vision of the kingdom. It's why we practice communion. We take it in. We take in the body and blood of Christ. We discover how to love deeply because we are deeply loved, with a love that is reaching out and welcoming in kind of love, to love in community because we have all been given a community of love, and to love our world in deed and in truth, living in God's vision. We all have a gospel. Gospel just means good news. As Jesus followers, we give our lives to Christ to be part of that message. Living in the vision of God is where we get to answer with our lives this question. What is the gospel according to our lives? Would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you that your kingdom is, is so paradoxical, upside down. It makes no sense to our world that tries to force things and have power. You say, let me start here, inside the deepest part of ourselves, the place where we are vulnerable and afraid, and say, Jesus, come in. Come into my soul. Guide me and direct me. Help me have a closer walk with thee. Open the eyes of our hearts. We want to see you, Jesus, and then be led by you. And we pray these things in your name.